China's annual political season kicks off after a two-month delay. Can China fulfill its goal of eradicating extreme poverty after combating COVID-19? And we meet the inspiration behind the medical drama House. How does the real-life House assess each nation's capacity and ability to diagnose their COVID-19 patients? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. China has entered its annual political season after a two-month delay caused by COVID-19 this year. On Tuesday afternoon, the third session of the 13th National Com Committee of the country's top political advisory body opened in the Chinese capital. The National People's Congress will also convene its annual session tomorrow. So what's on the agenda of this year's sessions and how will the gatherings help shape the policies against the backdrop of COVID-19. For further discussions, I'm pleased to be joined from Memphis, Tennessee, the United States by Professor Joseph Mahoney from the East China Normal University and via Skype in Beijing, Professor Wang Yao, President of the Center for China and Globalization. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Professor Wang, let me go to you first. Now, China is among the first countries to have uh, gone through the COVID-19 pandemic, although we're still in it, and uh, which has reopened its economy in a relatively orderly and effective manner. But domestic economic pressure and factors against globalization have created new barriers and obstacles to global trade and people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. So all these combined are making things particularly um, cap capricious, let's say. So how do you look at the backdrop, the overall context of this year's political season for China and your expectations on the upcoming meetings. Uh, thanks, thanks, Liu Xin. I think that uh, uh, today is really a very symbolic, uh, a very uh, significant day because, uh, uh, as you said, China has kicked off its uh, annual political season, uh, although two months delayed. But this two months delay shows that still China is firmly uh, in charge. And China is really uh, getting the uh, government work and also work, all works of life back to normal as, as much as they can. And uh, also, this is again after uh, really a, a lockdown in Wuhan and in uh, Hubei and almost China, whole China uh, at, in the February, uh, January, February, and now uh, uh, throughout the March. So, so I think this is actually achieved that uh, they have this uh, open day of the two sections where 5,000 delegates from all over China come to attend two sections. So it's really a significant day, so that shows China is uh, making progress. China is uh, boosting the confidence of the uh, Chinese people, but also to the world. So I think that uh, really, this is really a, 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 a significant achievement uh, of the Chinese uh, government and its people, and also the, the gaining the international uh, support and uh, uh, with the worldwide support on, on this achievement. Yeah. So China is also considering how they can better collaborate yeah. with the world to fight in coronavirus. Yeah. Professor Mahoney, let's uh, um, try to put this into perspective, put this into context for our international audience. I know many of them probably around this time of the year, normally around March, actually people would see these huge gatherings and people marching into meeting halls. What's special about this year besides the fact that everybody is, or pretty much everybody is wearing a mask and uh, why should people be paying attention to this? I think, I think there are a couple of reasons, of course. I think, uh, first of all, uh, this will be, the, I, I think, the first. Uh, we've seen many reports and, and discussions, but under the, the rubric of the annual work report that we see from the premier at the NPC, the National People's Congress meeting, I think we'll see a very full, comprehensive public accounting of what's happened. I think the world uh, wants to hear that, and it'll be a, a, a very nice uh, focus message for that. Uh, they'll recount the sacrifices, the achievements, uh, and the shortcomings that were encountered and, and the new reforms that will be uh, proposed to help deal with those shortcomings going forward, uh, as well as the rafts of support that China will introduce uh, to, to continue to try to recover, um, as well as new targets for growth and development. Um, and above all, it will, it will be, as, as my colleague uh, in Beijing said, a, a demonstration of unity and a model for others uh, about how to move forward. So I think, I think uh, people in China, but also globally, are looking for this image, this, this activity, 
at a time when there's so much uncertainty and even in, in various places uh, uh, suffering forms of governance mm -hmm. um, that this that this will uh, provide a good example of, of moving forward. Well, this year's political advisory body meeting will last seven days. That's uh, four and a half days shorter than previous ones. And uh, major interviews will also be conducted online, which is very different from the previous years. So we are going to have this year's two sessions in cloud, as some people are dubbing it. Professor Wong, how do you look at these adaptations under these extraordinary circumstances? What are the implications on the outcome of these meetings and the process of people bumping head? against each other in order to come up with ideas and making laws for the country? I think this is really a, a great occasion and also a great experiment of, of new form and a new normal and a new formalities, and particularly online uh, raised efficiency. Because China has gained quite a lot of experience in, in fighting coronavirus because we had this online uh, communication, online education, online entertainment, online delivery, uh, e-commerce, so China basically is online uh, with one billion, uh, almost one billion smartphone users, internet users. China is basically taking off for these uh, online uh, activities. So this, uh, this uh, 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 two sections are actually reflecting China's capacity for this whole online infrastructure that is best in the world now. So I think this probably will greatly reduce the uh, efficiency and also probably right so that we're going to cut the time of, uh, of discussion and com communicating uh, uh, via different uh, 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 locations. So this is actually a, a much effective, efficient way of doing this. So we may actually find a new uh, 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 direction for uh, you know how to combine the online efficiency with the offline uh, debate and all the things. Uh, we're probably going to see some new uh, you know, invention and new models coming up for the uh, for the parliamentary and the CPPCC meetings. So this this is, may not be a bad. And also this. Uh, Further evidence that China not only used the online big data, this uh, technology, combating the uh, device, leading the world in that, but also maybe in the government to government uh, 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 members of parliament and, and also CPC members of the uh, debate and the de deliberations, this may, may bring some new, uh, you know, fresh. Uh, uh, a way of doing things into the, right. into the reality, and that's also going to sink a lot yeah. uh, to the outside world as well. Well, it's not just about uh, these meetings going online or in cloud. Uh, actually, more is being done to enable delegates or members of the advisory body to reach out to the vast number of uh, netizens, 800 uh, million in China, by uh, actually already more than that. For instance, about two weeks ago, the meeting launched a platform on its website to s solicit public opinion. So this was said to be the first time that this has been done in order to reach out to ordinary netizens. How much do you expect people's opinions really being taken into uh, consideration, into policy making, even legislative work? Well, you know, I think the first, the first point to make is that uh, over the last several years, what we have seen is that the CPP, uh, CPPCC has continued to evolve. And it's, it's to, to, be, to be fair, it sometimes takes the appearance of two steps forward, one step backward uh, in terms of its attempt to find new ways to engage people uh, the, uh, in, in the process of governance and, and lawmaking. So, um, uh, you know, so this, this uncertainty or this, 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 uh, the way this change has taken place has made some uh, experts uncomfortable, but I think in fact, it represents a type of flexibility that is useful, particularly in moments like the one that we face. Now, uh, I think it's a very bold move uh, to include uh, opinions. Uh, I think anyone who's familiar with China in, in any uh, real sort of way knows that there's no shortage of netizens or opinions online in China. And I think finding a constructive way to engage that is, is, uh, is vital. Um, and it, it's it's good and it's good to do it in good times, but it's probably even better to do it in bad times. Um, but doing it in a way that that is going to be actually constructive, I, I don't yet know how they're going to do that. But I'm excited to see how it works out. Mm. Professor Wong, how do you look at the balance that needs to be drugged, uh, that needs to be stricken in in between having broad representation, having people. Uh, 
giving people the access to channeling their opinion versus potentially populist sentiment in terms of policy making where you are kind of led by public opinion instead of uh, wise decision making in the long term interest of the country in general. Professor Wang. I think that's probably the, the great uh, 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 progress, probably achievement China has made is that uh, on the one hand, China is uh, very centralized, is, uh, there's a strong uh, central government at, uh, uh, you know, that uh, very uh, detailed implementation capacities that is built through the layers of the government. But on the other hand, China is also in, in, embraced this uh, market uh, democracy, you know, the market economy and uh, is really flourishing in China. And what's more, this, uh, this new term of I call that dem uh, technology democracy is also emerging in China. For example, if we have, we have a 900 million uh, uh, billion smartphone users. So where to buy, where to go, uh, what to shop, where to pay, you, you, you're just voting every day. So mm -hmm. that's really uh, now coupled with this uh, opinion express, uh, with the WeChat, with the, uh, the Weibo. So you, you see a very complex uh, uh, dimension of China opinion pool there. But on the other hand, central government is also in, uh, in good uh, coordinating uh, capacity, so that is, is, is not gone wild, but, but everything, particularly uh, uh, occasions like two sections, the CPPCC, the, the, the top uh, uh, you know, advisors with, composed of 2,000 of them, uh, it's from all democratic parties, uh, non-government, uh, non-party officials, 60 percent of the CPPCC members are non-CPP members. So this is really uh, the, the elite. Uh, the, the uh, professionals, the, uh, the old works of life representative, has made this uh, consolidated democracy working in China through this uh, uh, annual uh, political season, uh, coupled with the uh, almost 3,000 delegates of the People's Congress. Right. So I think this is really working with technology of the democracy, market democracy, consolidated democracy. China is finding a new model, tackling all the things, but also not avoid the problem. Problem yeah. can be always coming up sure. through the social media. Well, finally, I want to touch upon this very important uh, target, which is to eradicate extreme poverty in China. This is uh, one of the central issues on the mind of uh, the current Chinese leadership. In fact, China's um, accomplishment progress in this uh, uh, domain has been mind-boggling for a lot of people. For instance, uh, some 800, even some 800 million people have been uh, elevated from absolute poverty. So calling China's achievements on President, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, said over a relatively short time span, starting from China's reform and opening up since late 1970s, China has substantially reduced extreme poverty, infant, child, and maternal mortality rates, and increased access to primary and secondary education, and made important gains in gender equality and combating HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. So, Professor Mahoney, Tell us about uh, your assessment of the possibility that China is still, is still able to reach the very ambitious goal by the end of this year, despite uh, all the havoc that has been wracked by COVID-19. Well, as we know, this year was supposed to be the big year that, uh, that China would achieve its targets related to uh, the moderately prosperous or the Shao Kong Shui. Um, and uh, to be fair, you know, I think uh, in the last several years it was clear that these goals uh, were going to be reached and they were going to be reached, I think, uh, 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 very notably with the very aggressive anti-poverty campaign. In other words, it wasn't just going to be that we were going to see these increases in per capita GDP, but we would actually eradicate poverty uh, or gross poverty in China. Um, I think, you know, it, I think there's some, some critical perspective here I, and I think Chinese people always have, or very often, most of them have this type of critical perspective. You know, it's like if you, if you set a goal that you're going to lose 10 kg over six months and you lose nine and a half uh, and you don't reach 10, it's, it's not that you failed. Uh, people understand that there's been an incredible um, uh, outbreak, uh, that, that this has had a, a, a tremendous impact, that responsible governance has, has gotten it under control. So I don't think people are going to judge this and uh, politically in a very negative way, I think they're going to uh, uh, shift their expectations and count their blessings. Yeah. Uh, I think, again, however, that uh, a lot of achievements have been made. They've been durable. Um, but we may see that there's been a few setbacks 
obviously, in terms of the overall objectives. Yeah, let's wait and see. We have to leave it there. Many thanks to Joseph Mahoney, professor from East China Normal University, and Professor Wang Huiyao, president of the Center for China and Globalization.